Now we are. Okay. okay. Um, Ada Anderson. Here. Andrea Suhaka. Bob Rocker. Hmm. Kathy Noon. You're on mute, Kathy. Is Kathy here? Where I is see she? Her name. So, okay. Oh, there um, she is. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> uh, Chris Lynn. Connie Ward. I'm here. Don Perez. I'm here. Donna Mullins. Here. Gretchen Lopez. Good morning. Good morning. Jim Dale. Here. We know Carrie's here. Perla Geller. Phil Sunanik. Sean Wood. Steve Conklin. Here. Tex Elam. And Winshaw. I'm here. And Bob Rocker, I see you just came on. Yeah, I'm here. I'm good. I'm here. Hello. Hello. Mindy, you didn't call me, but I'm here. I'm sorry? You didn't call me, but I'm here. Who is Barbara Boyer. Oh, sorry, Barbara. <laughs> Mindy, you didn't call me. I knew you I'm were here. here. I didn't call you. No. Nope. You know why? Because I was going down my list and marking you guys off before we got online and I started to ask. Sorry. <laughs> And Andrea's here now, and I bet Tex will pop in because he was just at our last meeting. Okay. All right. Do we have any guests today besides Debbie Haney? Who else do we have? Hello, everybody. Let's Happy see. New Year. Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year. What's up? I'm in a uh, yes, I'm a guest as well. My name is Diana Castro. I'm with Dr. Mack. Yeah. Are there any other guests? <clears throat> and then we have many of the Dr. Cox staff online. Do we want to just, do you want me to go through the whole list or can we just call it good? I think we can call it good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mindy. Mm. Do we have any public comment today? For many of our guests, that would be you, Debbie. Oh, and somebody from Dr. Mack is here. No? Yes, ma'am. My name is Diana Castro. I'm with Dr. Mack. Thank you. Okay, so no public comment. We can move on to the report of the chair, which is going to be short and sweet, but I will have to tell you important as well. There are two things that I do want to, to bring up, and one... I want to congratulate AJ, Dr. Cogstaff, because he has been invited to participate in a panel from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and they're going to have a roundtable about this Academy Health research, and AJ has just really been a leader in that field, so I just want to recognize him and congratulate him. Are you on this call, AJ? I don't see him yet. Well, you can pass on our, our you know, good yeah. job. And just, he's really been a leader in that with you by his side, Jayla. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is it's, I've just done this uh, project with my staff and there really is a difference between a job and a calling. And the job is something where you just go and you you go, you clock in, you clock out, it's done. A calling is something that really lives in your heart and you are called to do. 
And you can lose your job, but you can never lose your calling. And our fearless director, Jayla, has a calling. <laughs> she has been with Dr. Cog for 34 years this year. Mm. And it is much more than a job. And I just wanted to really put the spotlight on her for a moment and recognize that her calling has impacted thousands and thousands of humans. Thank you, Jayla, for sharing your calling with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you're right. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the calling, you don't have a choice, right? It's just, you have to do it. You, you really have to do it. <laughs> Well, we are lucky to be doing it with you in some small form. I know um, you have the same. Many, I know all of you have the same. You know, you have a calling to do this. It's not easy work. Yes, I would say everybody in this group has that same calling, but I really did want to recognize Jayla before we get into the meeting. We are lucky to have her as our leader. Thank you so much. Okay. Um. Speaking of our leader, we're ready for your report. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I have some notes here. I feel like I've just been going to meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, writing it down to remember everything I did, right? So they uh, have uh, working on the area plan on aging. Uh, remember, there's two phases of the area plan on aging. The first one is the compliance piece. Um, the compliance piece is the one that has to get done uh, and turned in. So it's, it's completed and AJ and several, um, and Kelly and Fonda and um, a, a lot of people, Sharon contributed to the writing of the area plan on aging. The compliance piece is with uh, the communications team here. They're doing their magic. Thank goodness, because I write in a very particular way and they have to cogize it for me. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, that's that's good. After that's turned in, the, there's a second phase and that's the more consumer friendly uh, version of the area plan, the one that we distribute far and wide. If you were to pick up the compliance piece right now, it's very clunky because it's very specific on what the state wants you to a a answer particular questions. And it doesn't give you a lot of um, opportunity to highlight what you've done or um, it, only in specific areas uh, can you talk about what you will do. Uh, so we're going to revamp that um, and uh, for the consumer piece, which then will go out in July, which is, which is really, um, uh, the one that, that I hope a lot of people will read and learn from. Um, a big component of that, you know, we have lots of ideas and a lot of goals and a lot of programs that we want to develop. The, the challenge will be financial, for sure. Um, and, and so a lot of my efforts, I think I told you this, uh, with it is the four-year plan, and then, and then it's about trying to figure out how to get more money for community-based services, for us and our contractors, for any older adults in this region, I don't care how it comes, but we've we've seen kind of a, a real, there for a while, aging was a hot topic, right? People were talking about it, a lot of people knew about it, and it's kind of gone behind closed doors again or behind the curtains, kind of a veil has dropped. Not many people talk about it anymore. And I wanna change that. And I think the four-year plan is gonna give me a big opportunity to do that, plus the CASOA reports, right? So you all will see uh, um, the, we'll get, uh, next month you'll have a preview of the compliance piece to the uh, state. I'll, I'll go through that with you. Um, and then uh, we will work on the, the consumer version. I have had a number of meetings with uh, people at the state level and federal level talking about uh, bills that are coming up, uh, about efforts that the state's doing. I can tell you there's a lot of talk about community-based services. I'm just gonna summarize these meetings and a couple of bills that are on the horizon that we're not sure what's gonna happen that include community-based services 
And I am trying to make sure that older adults are right there and everyone's thinking about older adults and community-based services. Um, there's money talking about, you know, uh, including community-based services uh, in Medicaid and in Medicare. AJ is working on a national committee to, to look at uh, uh, Medicare uh, funding codes for community-based services. It, there's a lot of talk there. I just want to, we just got to push them to the point and make sure that older adults, things like transportation, nutrition, in-home services, all the things that we do are captured in those dollars and that, that they only, right now there's a, there's a, there's a trend to just giving them to healthcare, like in-home services, healthcare dollars, right? Nurses going in um, and medical diets to some degree, um, but, and, and physical therapy going in, that's all good stuff, but we need that next layer of services, transportation, nutrition, in-home services, chore services, to be a part of those payment models and, uh, boy, have I had a lot of meetings and I've do, I'm doing a lot of talking and I'm trying to get data and I'm learning each meeting, but you know how a lot of times when you try, you'll have like 20 meetings and one you feel like was successful. <laughs> That's where I am right now. Um, but I'm going to keep on trying and the, each meeting I learn a little bit more about how to say it differently, how to talk about it differently the kind of individual that I need to get to in order to make action happen. Because there are people, you would think policy people would sometimes be the right person to talk to, not so much sometimes. Um, it's not, it's, you have to find someone before you get to the policy person that really understands services. And we're trying that had a meeting on the transitions program. There's a lot of changes happening in a transition. So Medicaid, HICPUF, has a program that we contract with them to help move people who, who live in nursing homes to move back out into the community. And you may recall this program requires a lot of community-based services. And so they're remodeling this program. And, it, and it's good that they're remodeling it, but uh, we, we didn't know where that left us. Are we going to have a contract? Are they not going to contract with us? What, that, what does that mean? And we were able to find that out. And then we're also able to understand there's this big pot of money that they've requested, over $5 million. And Hickpuff is saying, um, we're going to incentivize uh, or, or we're going to use some of the money to build the program in Mesa County. That's great. Um, and then we're going to incentivize nursing homes to participate in this program. And I'm like, wait a second, it's a law that they participate in the program. Yeah, but they don't like to participate in it. And I'm like, I know, but um, it's a law, they have to participate in it. And, and the other thing is, is uh, uh, we're moving people out of the nursing home into the community. And I told this person from HIPAA, I said, the irony is this program, when it was first started, was called Money Follows the Person. So wherever that person was, the money followed them to support that individual. So if they're in the community, shouldn't we be giving that money to community-based services like transportation and nutrition and in-home and chore and, and mental health to support that individual so that they can be successful? I also asked for recidivism rates. So how many people got placed out into the community and then actually came back because I know a few that have. Um, and they said they, they didn't have those numbers. And I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> you have to have those numbers because you pay for them either place they're at. You're either paying for them in the community or you're paying for them in the nursing home. You have those numbers. And she's like, well, they're just not readily accessible to me. And I was like, oh. Um, so there are ways that we could get more community-based services. You just have to understand, and it's taking a lot, a lot of meetings. Jay, um, Phil has his hand up. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Hey, Phil. Hey, hey, uh, Jayla, uh, thanks. I just wanted to kind of put some flavor on uh, what you're talking about uh, as far as behind the curtain. 
uh, listening to the legislators and members of the administration in their public addresses regarding the 2023 legislative session, no one, I repeat, no one mentioned older Coloradans. In addition to that, uh, there's a lot of undercurrent coming out of Washington relative to modifying and reducing costs of yep. social benefit programs, including yep. Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and Social Security. And Social Security. But um, <laughs> my thought is um, not only is it behind the curtain, but we're swimming upstream at this stage with regard sentiment, both at the state level and the federal level. You can comment, thank you. No, you're absolutely right. And um, that kind of reminds me, I, I talked to another person, um, a policy person from the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Programs. And she called to do an interview at uh, ARP's uh, uh, lobbyists um, is a good friend of mine, and and he suggested that they they uh, interview me, and so I answered all of their questions. And she was she was very young um, and very smart, clearly. Um, and I I was talking about how you know the current challenges in nutrition programs and what some of our contracted providers had told us: um, the lack of volunteers, the lack of staff, the food costs that have gone up, right? All those things. And she said, yeah, well, we're working on it. And hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to get it together. And I kind of just something in my brain clicked. And I said, yeah, let me make something really clear to you. Um, what we're talking about are people who really need this food. And they don't have time, respectfully, to wait for us to get our shit together. They don't. And she was taken aback by it and her eyes got really big and blinky. And, and, I, and I said, I, I, I don't, I want to be respectful, but I really need to impress upon you that the, we can't be patient anymore. People need this, these services and people are going, are, soon will be going without these basic fundamental services. And, and I, I can't be quiet anymore about it. I have to tell you how desperate the situation is. And she, she was um, surprised, I think, <laughs> that, that I was that bold. But I really do feel like we're in that position again. And I've been here before with uh, advocating for older adults. And I just feel like we have to really, really start um, not really, really sharing with how critical these needs are and what the consequences are if we don't. Carrie, did you have something? I, I just wanted to do a little follow-up question on Phil's comment, and it ties into what you're saying too, Jayla, is it's interesting to me that older adults are not being talked about and brought up to the forefront with our um, state officials and our federal electeds because we're looking at the data, we see the numbers, that hasn't changed. So a few years ago, as um, you and Phil both pointed out, we were really talking about it and there was a lot of attention. The numbers have grown. So I wonder why the shift is moving away from that. Just curious. I don't know if you have any comments, Phil. I just think it's not front of mind. And I think one of the things that we have to do is make it front of mind again. Front of mind. I need to tell you, I was so, so happy at the board of directors at Dr. Cog. We had a, a fairly substantial discussion um, about uh, the challenges in nursing homes and assisted living. And it, it just warmed my heart. I mean, I could hear people being really good advocates. And I thought, yeah, that's what we need to do. We just need to take that and, and, and grow it, right? Um, uh, because there's a lot of concern about closures in assisted living and nursing homes, particularly in the area of Medicaid facilities. Boulder has no Medicaid um, assisted livings at this point. Um, and one of our board members, Claire Levy, who used to be a legislator, 
um, what is very concerned about that and is getting constituent calls, right? And then it started to trickle around and people started to talk about um, their concern and their own personal experiences. And, and I was thinking, uh, when and Steve, how do we harness that? You know, how do we, how do we harness that and take it to the next level? Because I think we really, we really do need to do that. And, and Dr. Cog's board can make a huge difference. And, um, I, and next year's the time to do that. Uh, uh, this year we still have carryover money, but next year will be definitely the time to do that. But to start talking in every, everything that we do, always reminding people, yes, housing, housing, housing. What about affordable housing for older adults? Um, yes, yes, you know, workforce, workforce, yes. And older adults are in the workforce too. And what's going on there? And uh, healthcare. Um, and uh, yeah, did you know that older adults are facing this with Medicare and Medicaid changes? And just educating at every opportunity that we can about, about how these, these um, efforts that affect everyone are also affect, affecting older adults and just making that in front. But remember, I don't know if you remember this, Carrie, or you were a part of it, um, uh, but we were talking about it in the previous meeting is that when we launched Boomer Bond, we did a big, huge meeting. And we, and, and we had, you know, it was at a hotel and we had lots of people and we talked about the demographics and we, we talked about planning and, and it might be a time to do that again in the next four years. I didn't put that in my four-year plan, but now I'm thinking about maybe I should have, and maybe we could put it in the, you know, the bigger or uh, the more consumer-friendly version of the four-year plan, just mm -hmm. to really help again, people remember that our population is growing older and the power of an older population. Sometimes I don't think they, they see the power of an older population. Sorry, I'm going on and on. Um, uh, we had a joint meeting. We were supposed to host the joint meeting of the Colorado Association of Area Agencies on Aging. It was the day of the big storm, right? So, uh, so actually, it was it was in between. So all the AAA directors would have to be driving in on the day of the big storm, and it affected all the schools closed, right? All of that. So we canceled the meeting. We had it virtually, which was nice, and um, we. Uh, AJ came um, with uh, uh, someone from HICPUF to talk about the hospital transformation program and keep us aware of what's going in, on in that program. Um, and then Rich came to talk about kind of where we are and a few bills that are being introduced. Uh, we're not into that yet. And then Jared Hughes came. Um, remember Jared Hughes's position was the senior policy advisor to the governor he got promoted and now he's the deputy director of policy and research um, uh, for the governor, which is good. I mean, he has a lot of influence, um, but it's going to, he, he has so much more now than just aging. He is going to keep aging under his pre purview, but I don't think that they're going to hire another senior policy advisor. At least he didn't indicate that that was going to happen. We do know that there's a new position going in the state unit on aging um, at a pretty high level, but we don't know anything about what that person's going to do other than broad aging issues. That's what we've been told. So we're we're monitoring that and trying to figure out what all that means. There's also a new Colorado Commission on Aging, which um, Kathy suggested uh, that, that we have more information on. So we will definitely reach out, see if we can get uh, members that represent our area. We want the, to invite them to our meeting all the time. Remember that uh, in the past um, we had representation or they would come to our meetings sometimes. Uh, so we wanna make sure that they're a part of that, but we'd also like to have regular presentations from them about what they're doing. We had a meeting, uh, a quarterly meeting with our contracted service providers uh, to talk about some of the mandates, right? Uh, this is our, uh, our client satisfaction time. So the state 
asks us to do client satisfaction surveys and send them out. And so all of our contractors have to do that as well. Um, and so we talked about that and we talked about um, compliance issues. And then we kind of just talked about what the needs are. Again, still staffing, uh, having a hard time finding staff, uh, uh, um, cost of, of things, right? Cost of food, cost of vehicles, service supplies. And then um, again, hearing that the, the clients that they're serving are, are so much more frail than that they were pre-pandemic. Um, overall, in many ways, you know, physically, uh, mobility is down, cognition uh, is, a less, more confusion, more um, dementia, like, uh, you know, uh, problems. Uh, so, so there's a, a number of things that, that are a, a challenge. I wanted to take some time uh, because there's a lot of changes happening in nursing homes and assisted living. And I'm so glad Shannon jumped on. Um, I hope your staff gave you a heads up, Shannon, that I wanted you to kind of give an update uh, during my report. They did. Are you wanting me to do that? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. And Jayla kind of started talking about what's going on in, in Boulder. And we're, you know, we have far more facilities in in our region than Boulder, obviously, because they have the one county. Um, and actually, Boulder currently has three assisted living that accept Medicaid, but I don't know the size of those homes. And Oh, I thought she said that there were no more. No, they okay. had four and one was closing. And I think it was like 30 some odd residents. So it was a fairly large home. <clears throat> so I've been providing, I know I've been providing the updates um, to you guys in, in the in the written updates that Mindy sends out. And I feel like every time I write one, I'm talking about another facility that's closing. Um, and, and here we are again this month. So it's just kind of rinse and repeat. We have, we lost Little Sisters of the Poor which is a skilled nursing home that served um, an underserved population, which had primarily Medicaid residents. But again, it was a skilled nursing facility and they had 29 residents that closed in October. Um, Sunny Slope Estates was a 32 bed Medicaid home that was closed by the health department. And when the health department closes these homes, it's because they probably need to have been closed. It's, it's the timing in which um, we're provided that information that is frustrating because we don't have the time to really help relocate them appropriately. And in that situation, it was a 32 bed uh, Medicaid home. That home was purchased by another provider, but they ultimately had to move all the residents out prior to that happening. So that will be another Medicaid home. So that's not exactly a loss. So we'll still have those beds to choose from. It's just whether they're appropriate. A lot of the homes in our area that are assisted living that have Medicaid avail availability are for more of a younger behavioral health um, where we're really struggling is finding it for that older adult who needs true assisted living, maybe has some um, mild cog cognitive decline or just needs your basic services. Those are the those are the individuals that we're having a hard time finding placement for in the Medicaid system. Um, the verandas was one of those as well. Sixteen beds. It was closed by the health department. Porter Place is a forty-two bed um, assisted living that's attached to Porter Hospital. It was not Medicaid. Um, I believe some of them in there were Pace, <clears throat> so Innovage, um, and that's closing. I believe everybody's going to be re relocated by the 1st of February, but it's officially closing the 15th and the hospital is going to restructure how they're using that portion of the, of the campus. Uh, Vista View, we just found out this week, is a also is a skilled nursing facility that's attached to a standalone hospital up in Adams County, um, and they take event dependent population. So they have 25 residents who are almost all of them are in vents. <clears throat> so sorry, breathing. So breathe, they're, they're for lack of a, a nice way to say it, they're plugged into a wall. And that's the only high acuity, um, real high acuity that we have because they are attached to a hospital, they have respiratory therapists on staff. And that's what makes it so complicated for some nursing homes to accept vent dependent residents is because they don't have the, the respiratory therapy team 
readily available like they did at the hospital. But again, Vista View is going to be closed and the hospital is going to repurpose how they're using that space. We have actually relocated most of those individuals. There's only two that we're waiting on. Thankfully, we had another home um, that is able to take the vet the vent dependent, we might have two that are going to have to move down to Pueblo because there's not very many nursing homes that can provide that level of care. Um, North Glen Heights is letting go of their Medicaid in March, which is a large assisted living. And then we had a, a small home in Jefferson County recently closed. It was a Medicaid home, but it was closed again by CDPHE. So um, this um, is what I keep keep trying to tell myself to keep myself and the team a little calm is that this is this is part of a change that's been a long time coming. Um, the pandemic certainly um, provided a fair amount of opportunity to really shine a light of things that weren't working and really stretch people financially when we were in somewhat of an oversaturated market in, in our area. And so we're seeing a lot of closures, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think it's probably gonna get worse before it's gonna get better to be honest, but this is this is part of the change and we knew that the pandemic would change sort of the landscape of long-term care. And that's what we're seeing. And I think what that's gonna do is push for, for better options in long-term care. <clears throat> but what we need is better options that are low income. But I also think it's gonna then provide opportunity for home community-based services to also expand and realize that we need to be able to serve individuals in their home as well. I think the problem with a lot of these homes is that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm losing my voice. Um, I think the problem for a lot of these situations are these are people who would as otherwise be unhomed. So they weren't necessarily people or aren't necessarily people who, who would have a home to be in otherwise. And that's sort of the catch-all that nursing homes and assisted living have become for some of the Medicaid um, participants that we're working with. So it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, if we can get increased home community-based services, great, but we don't have homes then still for these individuals to go to. So we're, we're just seeing sort of an upheaval in the system and, and um, doing our, our best to sort of hang on and do the best we can advocating. Vivage, who's our largest uh, local management company in, in the state, has given up 11 of their homes. Uh, that they've been managing. They're all owned by the same corporation, which is a hospital uh, a hospital group, um, but they've decided not to renew the contract for those 11 homes. Nine of those are in our region. Um, and I'm sure that the new owners who are coming from out of state, we don't know them, are probably going to try to move to more of a rehab only model, which Colorado just doesn't have the market for. So um, the teams are the teams are busy trying to figure out where, where these folks are going. Fortunately, we've not have any We've not had any of these residents not be able to find placement. Um, but as that pool starts to dwindle, and then you have somebody like Boulder, who's a neighboring county, also then be sort of needing those beds outside of their region, it's going to put an additional strain on, on Dr. Cog's region. Thank you. I'm now I'm fine, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. Shannon, this yeah. is this is Phil. Hey, Phil. And um uh, the the element of good news I can take from what you've said is that no one as yet has been uh, you've not not been able to place. Uh, so what are the contingencies when the system is actually uh, so congested that someone cannot be placed, uh, and when might that happen? I don't know the answer to that question. We have not run into that. And I don't know that there are contingencies. The only time there's funding or contingencies is when the health department is the one who's doing the closing. Because then they have some responsibility to ensure that those individuals get, get placed. And then oftentimes they will pay to put them up somewhere else and provide services until they can get into an appropriate setting. When it's a voluntary closure, it is oftentimes there is no contingency. Um, and when it is a voluntary closure and they're behaving well, you know, so far it's been okay because a lot of these have been the private sector as well. And there's plenty of, of availability in the private sector in assisted living, especially there's, I mean, our market is just saturated with the private sector. That's why nursing homes have gone to such a behavioral health model. It's because 
the geriatric population has more gone to the private sector and assisted living. Um, it's nursing homes certainly still have those residents, but those are the residents who are going to be on Medicaid. Um, so it's a it's an excellent question, Phil, not one I, I necessarily have the answer to. If and when that day comes, I know there's going to be a lot of people involved um, between APS and Department of Human Services and our organization and um, whoever needs to be involved. But luckily, so far, that hasn't happened. I can tell you that there's contingencies for people that live in the rural areas, right? And that is, how do we get people to the metropolitan area? Um, so when a, a, a place closes in a rural area, they're like, all right, we, you know, the only, the only places available are in the Denver metro area. And so, you know, they start talking about how are we going to get them there? How are we going to bus them there? Who needs medical transport? Um, and that, and, and it's not just happening in our region that, that places are closing, they're closing across the state. And so, um, yeah, it's just an interesting time. Um, I always think about the residents. I think it's from being an ombudsman for so long and how it must feel to be 90 and frail and maybe have a little confusion and then be told you have to move to a place that you don't know where you're going or someone say, we haven't found a place for you yet, but we will. Um, sorry, that's, imagine how that must feel. Um, and I think that's the, the thing that I don't, it, it, this is hard. And there are people who die just during a transfer. Um, and, and it's important to not to remember that those individuals and not be, not systemize those people, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll find a place for them. That's wonderful. Who knows where they're going to go? And how, how hard that must be. Um, and I don't want I don't want us to forget about that that individual that that's having to go through that. I just heard this week from uh, someone who runs a severe weather um, network for as far as facilities, and they have somewhat centralized within multiple regions but folks that are homeless. Uh, so this is not folks that are in facility, but looking for a severe shelter. And uh, they will often, even in very severe weather, uh, refuse to be taken to a central place yeah. because it's unfamiliar. Yeah. Uh, so uh, your point about someone um, already with a bit of confusion when you have folks that are have higher levels of cognitive ability, not being, not wanting to go, uh, when the weather outside is uh, well below zero, uh, is kind of uh, that highlights it for me. Uh, I can only <laughs> I can only feel. Yeah. Okay. I think that's our report. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. We're gonna. No, that's fine. That is good stuff. Uh, that's good stuff for us all to know, but let's move on uh, to the approve the consent agenda. Um, the minutes, it looks like from October. Why is there minutes from two meetings, October and November? Because we didn't meet. It was, it was a special session. That's that right. Just to approve. Thank you, Mindy. <laughs> I would make that motion to approve both the October and November minutes. Second. Together. Second. Wonderful. Anyone opposed? All right. I think it sounds like those have those have been approved, Mindy. Thank you. And well, surprise, Jayla, you're back on. <laughs> um so we're going to have Jayla give us um, updates to the Older American Act. If you could pull up that presentation, Mindy, that'd be wonderful. I will. So uh, the, the Older American Rooms Act got reauthorized in 2020. Who knew? I mean, I knew, but we were thinking about a lot of other things, right, in 2020. And it, it took me uh, doing the area plan on aging to kind of go back through the area. Uh, go back through the Older Americans Act, and I went, wow, wow, there are a lot of changes here. 
Um, so I thought I would go over some of the highlights. Uh, next slide, please, Mindy. So just to remind you, um, uh, Congress passed the Older Americans Act in 1965 in response to concerns about lack of community social services for older adults. Uh, it authorizes a wide array of service programs through a national network of 56 state agencies, 618 area agencies on aging, and nearly 20,000 service providers. 281 tribal organizations representing 400 tribes. Um, and, and the Older Americans Act has been reauthorized several times um, and most recently in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that I wanted to tell you is that there are several changes um, that I, I, I'm, I'm showing you the changes that will apply to our area agency on aging. There are changes to Title V programs, which we don't have Title V programs. The state implements the Title V workforce uh, programs. And then there's Title uh, VI programs, which are Native American programs. And we don't have a tribe uh, uh, that's associated with our region. So we don't have Title VI programs. One of the big changes was in the, advi the advisory committee structure. Remember before in the Older Americans Act, we talked about county councils and that the county commissioners had to approve, um, that the county councils made recommendations to their county commissioners. The county commissioners had to approve representatives to the area agency on aging. That structure is no longer a part of the Older Americans Act. Um, Kelly uh, asked Kelly to look into the state regulations of volume 10 and the state regulations have changed significantly on this as well. So this is what the new advisory committee structure looks like. It's calling for people who, um, minority individuals, older adults living in rural areas, I'm not gonna read all of these things to you, family caregivers, service providers, representative of the business community, local elected officials, providers of veterans healthcare and general public. We are gonna talk about this uh, more in, in our next segment. So I'm gonna just let you know that this is what it is and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Um, another one of the, the, something that I was really happy to see is that kind of nod to business acumen and the ability to have outside funding for area agencies on aging. So it clarifies, the Older Americans Act clarifies that AAAs are not prohibited from providing services um, other than those authorized under the Older Americans Act. So there was some question and we got some um, questions from the state when we initially started doing things that the administration on aging told us to do, diversify, partner with hospitals and insurance companies, but it wasn't in the Older Americans Act, now it is. And so that really uh, gives us, uh, you know, should, should reduce all of those questions that we had in the past. Um, so it includes um, health, uh, health payers, so that's insurance as well as hospitals partnering with them. It also um, talks about pr developing private pay programs. So some AAAs across the country have done this, um, uh, developing private case management, developing education, a lot around di diabetes prevention. Um, so they, they develop the program and then they work with uh, private pay providers to offer it. So, that this is an opportunity for area agencies on aging as well to bring in more income. Um, and then uh, other, arra other arrangements that increase availability of home and community-based service and supports. So that could lead to some of the things that the state is doing. The state is looking at how to expand community services and supports for all ages 
Um, and this might be an opportunity for us to partner in different ways and look at different pots of money um, to, to expand community-based services. Next slide. If there are questions, just jump in. Areas of focus. Um, so uh, uh, trauma-informed care has been in the Older Americans Act for a while, um, but they made a strong point of emphasizing person-centered trauma-informed care. So really talking, because trauma happens to people and it's so specific that it's really important to um, personalize their, their program um, or their treatment program or the services to meet their needs for their particular, whatever they went through. Um, assistive technology, this is in the areas of, they talk about telemedicine, they talk about personal assistive devices, and then using technology for also the opportunity to provide training, um, in, uh, education, and social engagement. Vaccination, um, flu, it's never been in there before. Um, and, and what's odd about this is that this happened, a lot of this work happened before the pandemic when you think about it, right? Because it was reauthorized in 2020, but a lot of this work was happening before it. So um, I think the pandemic absolutely uh, influenced this and they added um, uh, uh, COVID language, but, but it was also about flu and shingles and uh, just providing services, having area agencies on aging provide services, education, information about vaccination um, opportunities and help make vaccines happen when they need to happen. Um, malnutrition. So this was something that wasn't talked about in the Older Americans Act um, before. We talked about nutrition, right? And nutritional needs to prevent malnutrition, but they never specifically talked about it as, so now they're talking about having assessments, particularly for malnutrition, um, meals to address malnutrition. Uh, so medical diets that would specifically address malnutrition, um, which is so important because this is a huge problem for, for the older population. Uh, I, I confirmed it when I was doing community conversations. I said, how many of you eat crackers and cheese for a meal? And I had so many hands go up and I'm like, yep. And you know what? That's gonna fill your belly, but it's not giving you the nutrition that you need. And it's a huge problem in our older population. Behavioral health, a big issue. Um, suicide risk and prevention. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the numbers of, of older adults who, are, who have committed suicide are going up nationally, um, as well as in our state. And so this is um, the Older Americans Act responding to that. Uh, really talking about uh, AAAs being able to respond to public health risks and health threats quickly. Um, there's language in several different parts of the Older Americans Act that talk about this. Uh, a lot, uh, language again, all the way throughout the, the reauthorization about social isolation and helping to prevent social isolation in a number of ways through technology, through outreach, through um, developing particular uh, different kinds of programs that would help reduce social isolation. Again, it's always been a problem in the older population. I think we understand it so much more um, uh, than we did uh, uh, because of the pandemic. This was something that I wasn't aware of. The women and the women and women and retirement center. So there is language for the assistant secretary on, on aging to create a center for women and retirement, and then programs that go along for it with it over the next four years, which is interesting. And we have not gotten direction yet on what that looks like. Again, a lot of language about promoting family caregivers, helping family caregivers, giving them the tools and information they need to be successful. 
um, a big emphasis on healthy, a healthy aging, which hasn't always been the case. I mean, this is a new, um, a, a new focus saying, you know, we want to help people get healthy, but we want to help people who are healthy remain healthy. And that's a different, um, a different interpretation or a different, there's more language about keeping healthy people, keeping healthy older adults healthy. Um, and then yay, finally, we have not seen research demonstration and evaluation programs in the Older Americans Act for I think 15 years and they're back. So that's pretty exciting. Next slide, any, any questions? Phil's got his hand up. Question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Jayla, um, as you're reading through this uh, additions to services definitions, uh, it seems like the home for many of these uh, had been uh, through services provided, at least in Colorado, by counties. Um, I haven't looked ahead on the slides um, and hopefully you will get to it, but uh, are there changes in funding that are going to provide uh, for the financial side, recognizing that uh, I think what I heard is the most severe challenge is financial and being able to deal with all of these? Yeah, really good question, Bill. Um, and, and there was opinion bill to go along with the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. It provided for, it was in the Build Back Better bill. It provided for a 30% increase to the area agencies on aging. That got stuck, right, in, 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 in Washington and in Congress. And so the in the president's budget, that language was moved into the president's budget in hopes that it would have a better chance it actually was moved into the inflation bill, but taken out the day before it passed. Dang it. So there was a bill that, that did go along with this that would have uh, shown 30% increase to older Americans Act programs. Unfortunately, that the financial piece did not get through. So we have all of these new recommendations and we don't have an increase in funding. I think there is, um, a, we did get a 9% increase, um, which I'm sorry, but that is um, embarrassing uh, considering the, the needs, but the, the, how big this population is, right? Um, and so there are efforts, but there is, I, I need to be honest with you, there is um, a lack of enthusiasm about adding any more spending uh, at this point. And, and, and everyone is saying it's gonna be super hard to get any, any additional funding, at least for this year, maybe next year. And then, and then hopefully maybe we'll be able to get more funding. Uh, it, it adds, uh, the Older Americans Act talks about sexually transmitted diseases uh, to be added to evidence-based uh, services, uh, chronic pain management, suicide screenings, um, uh, uh, fall-related injuries, screening for fall-related injuries, um, and then screening for uh, coordinated services related to social isolations, right? So, so really screening when you're screening for other things like nutrition or in-home services, we should be adding screening for social isolation. You can screen, but then it, it's important to have a service to address whatever you find, right? So wonderful to identify that somebody has a need, but if you can't fill it, what's the point of doing it? Next slide. It didn't advance, Mindy. There it is. So here's a little bit more about the National Resource Center for Women and Retirement. Um, it, it's kind of exciting. Uh, I don't know how it's going to play out or what the what the uh, you know what will be directed to do, but um, it's supposed to provide financial management training and education. 
retirement planning, at, uh, educational tools, and um, help identify and prevent fraud, fraud and exploitation in women. Next slide. This is uh, trauma-informed care, a little bit more about this. Um, there is uh, an emphasis on providing training, uh, technical assistance to providers who wanna offer this training, um, best practices, learning about, so the National Resource Center will have to provide best practices. Um, there, is, uh, there is already an entity that's kind of acting like the National Resource uh, Center for Older Adults, but um, th they're formalizing it now. And then trauma-informed services. Uh, there's a lot related to Holocaust uh, survivors uh, in this, but also people that have uh, gone through um, war or um, natural disasters, and then personal trauma as well. Next slide, please. Additional regulations. <laughs> um, uh, this this uh, encourages so that the, the feds realize that it's hard to transfer money from different parts of, so we have C1 funding and C2 funding and um, they're, they're talking about making it easier to do that and more flexible. Any kind of flexibility when it comes to nutrition is important. Um, uh, again, uh, allows, so there are different places all the way through the Older Americans Act in different parts that, that talk about social isolation, and this is one of them, allows services that promote social connectedness. So that's a big change there, social connectedness. We need to get a definition of what that means, but does it mean that we could provide more like fun and happy activities, right? To bring people together. Could I pay for um, a, a, um, a, a band or, or a piano player to be at a meal site to encourage them to come to the meal site? If that's the case, this is a really good thing. Um, I think that's what it is, but we're gonna have to see how the state defines it. Um, encourages, strongly encourages, I should have put the word strongly encourages, meal planning for culturally appropriate meals. Much, much more strong language here uh, than there has been about being culturally appropriate um, uh, and having culturally appropriate meals. So we're gonna have to work a lot with our service providers uh, in the metropolitan area uh, on this. Um, again, brain injury uh, allows programs to address traumatic brain injury. I'm not sure where this is coming from. Um, I have not seen so much emphasis on traumatic brain injury before. So that's interesting. I'm sure I'll find out more about this as we, we go on, but it is interesting to see that um, uh, pulled out so much. Um, encourages funding for multi-generational services especially those that co-locate. So there was a lot of talk in the bill about, uh, and then the like subsequent documents that go along with it that talk about daycare uh, for older adults and combining that with childcare, anything, uh, food programs that, that, that happen where kids get food and older adults that making sure that, that we prioritize those services. And then um, requires outreach to Holocaust survivors. So we work with Jewish Family Services and we have a, a really good relationship with them, um, but we probably need to up our uh, coordination with them when it comes to Holocaust survivors. They connect with Holocaust survivors and have the um, names of all the Holocaust survivors that live in Colorado. Next slide questions at this point. There's a lot of information. It's kind of surprising, huh, how many changes there are. Um, so Jayla, since this was a 2020 passage, um, and uh, your um, analysis is uh, current, and it's now 2023, uh, how many changes have you seen? None. 
<laughs> um, and that's the point. I mean, I'm like, well, I, uh, I didn't even know this existed. Um, and we had some language in our and our and our um, area plan on aging that said respond to these questions from uh, the administration on community living. And I said, what? What? When did that change? And we haven't gotten information from the state about this. Um, so I'm guessing, I don't think we'll see a lot of changes in the next reauthorization, but who knows? Um, there may not even be a reauthorization like next year, like it's supposed to happen. Um, there's talk about it now, but I don't, and there's certainly the state has not adapted so what happens is the Older Americans Act changes and then the state rules change and the state rules are in the process of being changed right now, but we haven't really seen what they're coming out with. Um, this is good language in that it, it, it encourages us to um, improve existing transportation programs um, and encourages things like uh, the Ride Alliance, which we're working on um, uh, coordinating transportation uh, uh, better and, and finding more ways to uh, increase accessibility um, and options for surveys. So pretty much talks about <coughs> mobility management in here. That's the language that's in the law. It's kind of confusing, but um, that also really strongly encourages that we partner with other funding sources like federal highway dollars, which we already do. Um, uh, for transportation services. Next slide. Hey, Jayla. Yeah. I just had a comment on the last slide. Sure. Um, one of the things that we're doing with the Lone Tree Link, which is an on-demand transportation um, microtransit uh, facility, um, is we are making it uh, part of the RFP contained a requirement that not only they work with the phone app, but also they allow people to call literally with the telephone. Hello, will you send uh, the link to the Lone Tree Art Center or whatever it is? But um, I will tell you there was a whole lot of excitement from the people at Morningstar that we told this to. Um, they're going to have public works do training, but there are definitely ways that even the newfangled on-demand services can be made user-friendly for all ages. So yeah, I'm I, I thankful for that um, because I think it's so important that we yes. have a, a call-in way to do that, right? Because uh, yep. not all older adults uh, feel comfortable. They're getting there, but not all of them feel comfortable or have the ability. Um, Correct. I notice my, I, I keep on wanting bigger, bigger screens on my phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, elder justice, there's a lot more elder justice activities. Um, uh, extends the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Act by one year, and that was last year, so I don't know what happened to that. I think that's gonna be interesting. Um, they really, I in my mind, they should really help those programs because grandparents, there are so many grandparents raising grandchildren, especially in, in the state of Colorado, over 200,000. Um, updates best practice standards for community-based ombudsman programs. So there are, this is a growing trend is that there are ombudsman programs. Kind of glad Shannon jumped off because she doesn't need to hear this right now. Um, uh, there are uh, more and more states developing community-based ombudsman programs. The problem is, and we, we would love to do this, but they have to give us a ton more money. And that, I just don't see it. You can see the bill called for um, a, a big 6% increase each year um, over four years for the ombudsman program. That is nothing um, compared to what they have to do, particularly since the pandemic. Oh my gosh, the workload in the ombudsman program has increased significantly. Next slide, please. Uh, caregivers assessment. So that's a shift. Now they don't, they want us to um, assess older adults. That's always been the case. But if they have a caregiver, they are now requiring us to do caregiver assessments. 
um, so that we can support those caregivers. Very interesting, not sure how it's gonna play out at the state, but um, uh, yeah, big. that's a big shift um, and, and it's gonna take more resources. Um, uh, ask the sec assistant secretary again to um, develop more caregiving assessment programs and, and best practices for this. Um, and then removes the 10% funding cap for older relative caregivers, um, which is just a, it just frees up a little bit more money uh, to, to, to provide caregiver support. Next um, slide. Jayla, in uh, defining caregivers, uh, it talks about family caregivers in the last piece. Does the assessments and uh, support that's to be provided include family caregivers, particularly spouses. Yeah, all this is all about family caregivers. I should have said that it's only family caregivers. It's not um, a professional caregivers. So it's all about family supporting family caregivers. You know that the statistic there's a I can't remember what it is, but it's there's a high um, for those family caregivers. Oftentimes the family caregiver dies before the caregiver because it's so stressful and so hard. They're taking all of our focuses on that, on the caregivee. Um, and, and we, you know, we, sometimes we miss the fact that the, we don't know that the person's um, uh, uh, heart, uh, uh, blood pressure has gone up significantly. And then all of a sudden we have a situation where we don't have a caregiver anymore because they passed away. And then, and then that, the whole dynamic changes, right? Um, wow. And, and often the family caregiver is, uh, has an economic impact. Absolutely. The family, but also to the community uh, in, in providing that service. And unfortunately, family caregivers are often pressed into service as opposed to necessarily volunteering. So I don't know why this slide is in there. It shouldn't be in there. So. Um, next slide. I think we're done. Are, are we done? Yep, you're done. Yep. So that uh, uh, that's where we are. Lots and lots of changes. So like I said, the changes happen at the federal level. Everybody was consumed by COVID. Um, and, you know, we are building back our services from COVID. So I'm kind of glad that the state hasn't implemented new requirements. We're seeing more requirements coming in the area of nutrition right now. Um, I Some of the things are really, really good. I just, we need money to do them. Um, we're already gonna be stretched, right? Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to implement some of these programs. And we will, we'll find creative re ways to do it. Um, we always do. Um, but the assessments are, you know, if we have to add caregiver assessments to our case manager program, to our in-home services program, to um, which I think are the two that are likely to come first, um, I think that's just going to add more time and resources. Then you do the assessment and you identify all these problems, and then you've got to make referrals to other so that you can help that individual. And then there's gotta be money to provide those services. It's just, it's not one easy thing. When you say assessments, it's, it's unethical not to follow up on what you identify. Okay, you identify this person needs help in these areas, but then you don't give them any resources. That's not okay. And that's exactly what will happen, yeah. Jayla. Yeah. I mean, all the changes and the new things that are in here sound very exciting when you look at them. and you can get hopeful and really encouraged, but then you're absolutely right. If there is not money, we can't do any of them. Yeah. So, it really, thank you. Um, and Mindy will send that. We've already got that slide. I think Mindy sent it out to us earlier, so we can go and refer to that. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, we're going to get to hear from Kelly and Kathy about the regional summit updates. Yeah, after uh, Jayla's report, I almost feel like saying buckle up because <laughs> we are now going to talk about how some of those changes that uh, Jayla referred to are going to happen. 
for the uh, AAA. So you all remember the summit that was held on September 30th. And um, those of you who were there know how well it was uh, received, the level of participation and enthusiasm. People seem to be very interested in having uh, ongoing uh, abilities to connect with each other. So, and I have received inquiries from some people since, since then. So, Jayla uh, formed a small work group to help explore how to, how to move forward with the idea of a, a network in the mix. And so, that work group consisted of Jayla, myself, Mindy, Fonda on staff, and Kathy Noon. And, Kathy has been worried that you all might be upset with her that she got to do that, but I kept telling her, no, they're relieved that you got to do that. <laughs> and so we have had a series of meetings um, in December and January, and we are pretty excited to share with you some of the recommendations that we are about to make. Um, I'll, I'll mention that Regarding the summit and the conversations that occurred at the summit, and given the input we got through the surveys that were done of all the councils on aging and commissions in advance of the summit, it became very, very clear that in particular, the county councils on aging were severely impacted by COVID. Uh, their memberships have dwindled. Um, the memberships that, that they have aren't representative of their communities. And it's also become pretty apparent that quite a few of the county councils on aging have little or no relationships with their county commissioners. And for those of you who don't know, we rely on the county councils on aging with the structure of our advisory councils and appointments by the county commissioners to the ACA. By contrast, the aging and senior commissions housed in the various cities throughout our region seem to be going a little stronger. Um, Aurora, Aurora's uh, aging commission is very, very active. Commerce City has fairly good membership as does Thornton. And probably even more, uh, uh, interesting is that the aging and senior commissions, by the nature of how they are formed and appointed, they absolutely do have relationships with their city staff and their city council people. So with that in mind, we decided to explore the idea of expanding the um, involvement and representation on the Advisory Committee on Aging. And so we looked at the language that Jayla referred to uh, in her presentation and clearly um, the, both the feds and the state had removed the mandate about us relying on county councils on aging for, um, for really peopling our uh, advisory committee on aging. And we were also very intrigued with the different categories of rep representation that they're, they're mentioning, the family caregivers, service providers, representatives of the business community, local elected officials, and the general public. So with that, I'd like to pass the baton to Kathy to speak to that a little bit, the, the distinction and, and what we're looking at. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so, and I, and I saw that uh, Phil popped in with a comment that, but you know, the funding goes through human services, but we need to also remember that we are funding a lot of things through vouchers and other programs now. So our funding does not look the same as it used to look. So that also leaves us opportunities to be able to look outside the box. So, um, and I think given the, the fiscal constraints that are gonna be coming our way, we're gonna be looking anywhere and everywhere for money to be able to serve seniors. So um, opening up 
uh, perhaps some of the dollars that the cities got from COVID money, where they, in some ways, had to look for ways to spend that. Well, to, to be able to resource in with Dr. Cog and say, you know, I've got this to use, how can I use it? Where, where's the most need makes a lot of sense. So that's a little bit of a side to, to Phil's comment. Um, so in looking at, at, the, at sort of the composition and, and, and how this really benefits our group is that right now, you know, because things are sort of funneled through the, con through the county, if you're sitting on the Dr. Cog board, as I did, as Steve does and Wynn does, when they're talking sort of, you know, ACA and, and AAA things, other than those that have a good interest because they're great committee members, it, it doesn't necessarily hit you. You know, you're not looking at the budget line that you have to deal with because it's gone through the county if you're a city council person. However, if if now we broaden this horizon a little bit and we say, wow, you know, the, the Centennial has a senior commission, Lone Tree has one, Commerce City, whatever. Um, and I'm having conversations with those folks and now they're part of the, the bigger Dr. Cog picture and, and discussion on aging. I think it brings a whole new level of interest and commitment to aging issues in our community and especially within Dr. Cog. And, you know, sometimes you'd see people, you know, when I was doing this, just sort of glazing off when we got to the ACA part, like, okay, let's move on. You know, I got the meters running and um, because you don't have that funding things are changing. So this seems like a good opportunity with the level of interest that we got from our summit and the struggles that were certainly shown throughout the, the summit feedback that we received. And now knowing that the direction of the um, Older Americans Act and the state funding will allow us to do some things differently. And we do believe bringing in things like the business community, um, the challenges that are hitting our service providers are hitting the greater business community. They're out advocating, you know, for relief in those ways. Why not add what we're advocating for as well? So we do believe that this um, will allow us to be broader in both our outreach and our ability to serve more folks and hopefully our funding, but especially our advocacy. And that's one of the, the biggest things that we want to do is if, if funding is going to start going down, it's gonna take even more of us advocating to say that those dollars need to come. So we've, um, we, we're, we're looking at, like you say, some other, some other tools in the toolbox to help us get where we need to go. But the first one would be to do, to do that sort of relook at what our, what our membership might look like, knowing that there's a, a bylaw change that needs to happen and some things like that. This is not an overnight um, you know, fix, but I think it's very doable. And I think that for the benefit of, of our organization and the benefit of our seniors, it's, it's a, a great opportunity for us. And um, we've talked about some working groups to try to uh, put this, you know, how, how we'll move forward. We've talked about um, informational webinars and trainings and grants and a lot of different things that we could put into place to help bolster um, what's going on in our community and in a different way. Yeah, and I'll add there that we by no means are intending to not involve county councils on aging. This is about expanding the network of involvement. And uh, Kathy mentioned the webinars. And so it, it's great timing in some respects because we have the COSOA surveys and the four-year plan that are all in the about ready to be um, distributed in the early part of next year. So in terms of the webinars, we were thinking of a webinar, if we can make it happen in February by Dr. Cog's staff that will reacquaint the people, not only the people who came to the summit, but other members of their commissions and their councils and other entities out there who would be interested in getting, again, a, a, a picture of the aging populations in the counties. A second webinar, we could do an in-depth presentation about the findings of the COSOA surveys. Um, we've had requests for that information. 
Aurora's commission is chomping at the bit to get the results of their COSOA survey. And then a third webinar could be the four-year plan and what we have identified are the strengths and weaknesses of older adults in our region and start planting the seed for how these local organizations can be involved with actions to move projects forward and also advocacy. And then finally, another um, webinar, perhaps in the fall, where we could share information about advocacy, where we want um, people to, where we need help with advocacy at the local level and tools and tips for effective advocacy. So uh, um, I've had many a conversation with Bob Brocker um, over the past couple of years about how to um, how to retool advocacy training so that it's more targeted, so that people are being asked to do very specific actions um, in regards to an issue. And Doug, I know that you may be a little bit nervous about the ACA becoming um, more involved with advocacy, but um, we obviously would uh, cooperate with the various steps that we need to do that to be uh, in step with the board. So that's it in a nutshell. We just came from a 90 minute meeting talking about this. So this is really an abbreviated look at what we're proposing. I would be interested in hearing your reactions to what we're proposing and then before um, I don't have your attention anymore, I'm also very interested in seeing if any of you are interested in uh, start in being involved with a work group or at least an initial meeting of a singular work group that may need to have subgroups. We've got bylaws to deal with, we've got technical issues, we've got the webinars, we're proposing to explore the idea of the ACA having a policy committee. So there's all kinds of really juicy stuff to think about um, doing. So Mr. Rex, I, I guess we're gonna leave it to you to, to uh, you gotta squash us like a bug now, or are you gonna <laughs> open that door for us? I can say these things to him. <laughs> No, I'll, I'll squash it later offline. Okay, no, I'm good only, to know. I'm only teasing, I'm only teasing. No, um, listen, I was I was kind of in and out on that conversation. So um, I, I'm i sure I can get a, a, a another briefing here coming up, but um, I know Kelly mentioned the advocacy component. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's part of the responsibility of the AAA and, and, and others with regards to, in, in the Older Americans Act, the importance of that. Of course, we have to do it within curbs, of course. We don't want to look, get, we don't want to look like we're lobbying, um, but, uh, but certainly that is an important component to make sure that, all, that our older adults and people with disabilities are being treated the way we expect them to be treated. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the concept for sure. I, I appreciate Kelly mentioning that, you know, this is not something that has been directed at something that the county councils have or have not been doing, but it's it's actually an expansion of, of, of that. And, and quite frankly, I see, I see uh, an avenue here where it could actually help the county councils and in, in, um, the, because the, where the local communities become more active in this, that maybe they want to serve on the county councils as well. So there's, there's some, um, you know, some consequences here that, uh, that probably would be good for all of us. So anyway, I'll just leave it there. Um, it's, it's definitely an interesting concept and, and I'm sure there'll be more conversation. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time and on this working group. Stephen Wynn, I, I'd actually um, be very interested in what you're thinking as a board member, you know, and especially as leadership board members. Paul, well, thank you. I, I'm happy to, to comment. I feel like um, it is a good idea. I do think that if uh, that 
that sharing the information is uh, different than um, being on a group who is a decision-making group, because when they get so big, right, it's like the, the whole Dr. Cog board, you know, it's it's tougher to uh, to to be a nimble decision maker. Um, but uh, certainly for um, getting out in the community and providing them information and training, and as was said, have them activate um, within their uh, not only their jurisdictions, if they're more local than a county, but also in their county. So I, I like the idea. Well said. Uh, I, I would just chime in that I think any communication that we can have, any working together to, to share those common issues and challenges and steps is, is positive. Uh, you know, somewhat unrelated this morning, uh, Edgewater has a coffee every Friday morning. And today was one of those where I sat with a group of seniors and, and heard just a, a vast degree of issues and concerns. And, and I think the more we can, can be, be talking about those things and bringing those forward and looking at things with a, a lens of, of, of those issues, and that really goes for whatever we're doing, I think that's helpful. Well, I can tell you that when we started our senior commission, you know, back when I was mayor, and in the beginning had, you know, you know, a number of them coming to our meetings at our county council, I don't think they felt like they were doing anything. So they sort of stopped coming. And it's like, well, you have your task and that's not what we're doing. And what we've seen um, is that the, the direct correlation and the direct um charge that a senior commission has because they are created by ordinance they are you know oftentimes have funding from their from their um their county count their city council it, it's different i mean they feel empowered they fear they need to do something they're held accountable and so being able to say you know at the same time the first thing they want to do is run out and start a transportation system we need a little van we need a senior center. And I mean, we just go down the same rabbit holes at every one of these. So what we need to be able to say is, these are the things that, you know, we we, we hear you that, that we know you need because we all need them, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel in every little entity. But at the same time, there are definitely things you can do in your micro area that maybe can't be done countywide, given the size of your county, given the, the the challenges that you meet from east to west or north to south or whatever it might be. So I think we a, a different way of looking at this is we're going to all be advocates. That's what we're going to be, advocates for seniors. It doesn't matter what, whether we're a council member or a commission member, we're an advocate in our community. And how can we work together and how can we be efficient in that work? Because we don't have the time, the people, or the money to spread that peanut butter any thinner. Yeah, and I think something that Dr. Cog is known for with all of our programs is that we can bring people together mm -hmm. so that they can benefit from the exchange of information and best practices. So while on the one hand, we're looking to the communities to help us advocate, we realize that we can provide a, a forum for them to be exchanging information and and doing what Kathy's saying and not reinventing the wheel all the time. And I think that sentiment was very much expressed at the summit where they, they're hungry to learn from each other and they are very interested to, um, to figure out how to rebuild their memberships. And I think- Yeah, if I could. Like, sorry, sorry go ahead, Dan. <laughs> I, I, oh. One thing that I really got from the summit was, you know, listening to people saying, oh, we're we're really doing good in this area, in this area, but we need more information. What can you provide us? And and so, you know, when we they love the demographic information, we need more people to hear that. 
um, we need to know about needs in our community so that we can take that information from the credible Dr. Cog and take it to our council or take it to um, our county and say, hey, so, you know, we've been seeing this and now Dr. Cog says it's true too. Um, so it's really like giving them the tools and information and then the training to be really good, effective advocates wherever they are, um, to deal with those community needs, um, uh, city needs, and then and, and then county, and then hopefully regional, right? Because we have some really big regional issues that we have to deal with. Yes, transportation um, in a circular is important, but what do, you, what do you do when you wanna go out of the county? Um, and what do you wanna do if you wanna go out of the county or out of the city after five, right? And and, and those types of things. How do we address those regional issues as well? So um, that's the goal is to provide information and, and tools so they can be effective advocates. We also are gonna need them to help us advocate um, for, the, for, for more community-based service dollars uh, in, the, in the state legislative process. And we just need to think of creative ways to do that, right? We're going to ask our, our um, service providers to help us, and hopefully we can get older adults in it. I, I really would love it if older adults would have kind of the same mentality as people with disabilities. Don't make any decisions about me without me, right? <coughs> um, and, and, and when you're talking about family services, remember that grandparents are a part of the family, um, and, and, and they should be included in those conversations. So I saw... Uh interest from both Barb and Phil about helping launch the work group. Thank you. And I will be in touch with you as well as some other folks who said they're interested in at least lay, laying out a roadmap for how we get from where we are now to where we're visioning. And um, I appreciated Bob Brocker's comment in an earlier meeting about taking the time to really do some big picture thinking. What is the purpose of the Advisory Council on Aging? We need to be able to convey the purpose and what the expectations are and also why others would want to get involved. So we've got some thinking to do and brainstorming as well as strategic planning, which I love. <laughs> Kathy's got her hand up. I just wanted to reassure everyone that we are not looking to change, make any major changes to the funding subcommittee. So when we talk about expanding, it's not like the, the funding subcommittee now got huge and poor Sharon's got, you know, 50 of us to herd. Um, the thought is that that group would still be representative of the areas and, and do sort of what they've been doing. So I, I just want everyone to understand that's our, our primary purpose. The, the you know, Older Americans Act does say we need to spend those dollars. So, you know, that that is the charge we're given. So I think, you know, we can rest assured that that piece will not look significantly different. And that our discussion about the webinars was having them live on would be a further way to spread the message, have that information be out there. Someone new is just interested, whether it's a legislator, whether it's a new member to your commission or your board, or it's it's this month's meeting, you know, they're always looking for someone to speak at a meeting. Well, we're going to play the webinar on the CASOA and discuss. And, you know, we almost all have a, a Dr. Cog staff person there that we could at our meetings that we can ask questions about. So I think we can use these tools um, more than once. And I think, you know, they say you have to hear something three times before it really hits. So we want to have it out seven. there. No. Yeah, well, it's seven because <laughs> we're all getting older. I was trying to stay young, Jayla. But um, but yes, you need to hear it more than once and you need to know where to find that information if you're going to spread that word. And I think Dr. Cog's the perfect place to be the, the placeholder for this important information that is statistically valid you know, you've been doing it a long time and this is quality work. This is not just I Googled senior stuff on the internet. And so I think we want to be that that expert. We have been. We want to stay that expert, but we want to expand who gets to hear those words. 
I really like this um, because what it sounds to me like is we're really empowering all of the groups that are already meeting. We're giving information for them to feel like they are leaders in their communities. I think of small communities that don't have access to information. They want to look to making the lives of their seniors and their older adults better in their communities, but they don't have all this information that Dr. Cog has. And being able to spread that out so that we're really empowering these other groups sounds exactly what we're made for and what Dr. Cog does best. So I'm excited to hear more about, about what uh, the committee comes up with. And thank you, Kathy and Kelly for really being the leaders in, in taking this on, it was a, I know it was a lot of information and a lot of work. Okay. I'll be saying Kelly did, Kelly pulled a lot together for us. She is, she is a great uh, sheep herder. Well, Kelly's good. We all know that <laughs> Kelly is good, um, but it, it's exciting. Much. This is exciting. And I think it really does empower more people. So that we then can come together with a unified collective voice for change. Okay. All right. Well, what about our Dr. Cog board reports? We got to hear a little bit about Edgewater. What else is going on? There hey. you go. I'll, oh, thanks. Go ahead, Wendy. Uh, I can start, you know, um, the dialogue at the Dr. Cog table continues around um, how to uh, and how much to uh, integrate housing into the transportation discussion and location of, of uh, you know, high density and, and as Jayla pointed out, um, some recognition of um, you know, this housing needs to be for workforce, but also um, the aging population who might be looking to downsize but can't afford to do it because everything's so expensive. So um, uh, I think that's the most uh, important thing that we've been talking about at the board. Um, uh, that impacts this committee. And in our work session this week, this coming week, we'll be talking about that as well. Basically, what might be the role of Dr. Cog in a regional conversation about housing? Uh, you know, housing is obviously a, a hot button issue. It's something that's being talked about at the state legislature, something that, that communities talk about. And what's the smart regional strategy? And how do you understand the the unexpected consequences of things that you may do that, that in the long run may hurt other populations. Uh, you as, as, as you, uh, you know, create new housing opportunities, is that taking away the less expensive housing opportunities and just kind of looking through those issues? So we, we don't have um, any specific direction at this point, but, but we are having that conversation about how we may fit into to that, that conversation. Uh, the other thing I'll mention briefly, for those of you that bike, if, if you bike or if you know people that bike, uh, Friday, February 10th, so a couple of weeks from now, is Winter Bike to Work Day. Now, given how the weather's been swinging, we'll see how that goes. But uh, if you're out there, just be aware there may be more bicyclists that day biking to wherever they happen to be going. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. My Steve will be happy to hear that you've shared that. Thank you. Um, You're very welcome. Donna? I can't find my little hand. Um, I just wanted to say that I think one of our jobs with the city and this, not the city so much, but the state is to become, to raise awareness of senior housing because from everything I'm hearing, it's really not high on the ladder in terms of awareness. So I think that's a big part of what we need to be doing. I, I agree. I think in general, whatever we can do with whatever issues are out there to put that senior lens on some of those policy decisions, you know, I, I think it's easy to forget some of those things. And, and uh, 
uh, at least my viewpoint is we need to be with whatever we doing are doing, looking at how it affects all communities and to me, especially the senior community. And I do want to echo that that this is Jayla's calling and Jayla's staff's calling, and we appreciate so much all they and and everybody on this call does. Thank you. Well, let's move on to our county reports, and I will say we are right on time. Gosh, look at this. Um, Except you had Doug raise his hand, so that just blew us out of the water. Oh, I didn't see your hand, Doug. No, I was just clapping in, in support of Steve's comments about staff. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Kathy. You. Thank you. Any county reports that you would like to share with the group? Um, I would like to just say um, one big thank you to Erica Dubray. She took, um, well, we, we had the big survey for the county, um, uh, you know, the whole county, and she did an excellent job and then came back the next month and uh, did a whole um, presentation on choice services along with Lauren Bell, who and they did an awesome job, and I've had lots of positive comments on that. So I just want to pass around along that. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Any other county reports? Mary, I uh, just want to let you know that the Seniors Council of Douglas County is working on its education series, and we do have speakers planned for the first two quarters of 2023. As far as housing is concerned, we're having Artie from the Housing Partnership speak about some new lo supposedly low-income senior housing coming to Douglas County. And because of the results of our survey, folks wanted some ability to have some virtual meetings. So once a quarter, we're going to be in the hearing room in the Philip S. Miller building and having a virtual as well as in-person meeting. And for March, it's already. Uh, so if you're not able to join us in person uh, the first mm -hmm. Thursday in March, you can certainly kind of WebEx in and listen to his presentation. And I uh, would like to invite any and all folks to any of our meetings the first Thursday of each month at 10 o'clock in various locations. And I can get that presenter series out to Mindy for distribution, if that would be okay. Thank you, Gretchen. And I, I think it's really neat how we are using this hybrid system of communicating now, because not everybody can make in-person meetings. So that's right. nice to hear that's happening in Douglas. You, hi, Tex, what do you have? <laughs> An observation, a couple of observations about uh, RTD. This is a period in which they are um, completing a process or trying to complete a process that they decided on about oh, three years ago of modifying the services that they provide in that instead of offering services everywhere all the time they're now trying to concentrate on services particularly within the inner part of their area that doesn't mean that all routes will be canceled or anything but it does mean that they are beginning to focus or refocus because it uh, on um, bus routes and such that um, they've kind of let pass by, but were very important to local communities within the Denver specific uh, Denver city areas. And some of that has uh, implications. Uh, an example is that they have now permanently canceled two of the original light rail lines. The F line, which went from uh, the southern end of I-25 up to uh, the center city, you know, up to um, uh, 17th Street and such, is now 
canceled. It is, they will no longer be reporting on it. A second uh, change is also on the Western, the, uh, the Western part, they have canceled the sea line, which went from uh, Littleton over to the uh, train station. The result of that uh, is that for many people, it's going to be impossible to um, get comfortable in a seat because you're going to change your seats. Uh, an example is if you live south of Hamden Avenue on the I-25 line, you will now have to get out of the train that you're on if you're going downtown and get another train. Mm -hmm. That's a very uncomfortable transition for people. Um, and it's going to be very difficult because I don't know whether you've ever ridden a uh, light rail and had to change at Broadway station. <laughs> it's not it's not meant for changing. It's it's um, there are no um, places that aren't windy, as an example. So that's one of the things. It's that's uh, it's already happened. Those are, those have been canceled. I don't mean that they've been canceled without consideration that that's been taking place. But it is true that that's that's the new situation. Uh, Tex, yeah. Question: As they're discontinuing the services, RTD is discontinuing the services to the. I'll refer to it uh, the further reaches of the Denver Metro. How are they rec rec reconciling that with? The fact that the taxing district for RTD uh, is uh, still across the entire metro region. I, I think with great difficulty. Um, RTD is not flourishing financially. And um, they're under a great deal of pressure to service uh, low income people particularly within the city, it's been felt by the leadership that, um, that there's been a failing historically. And so right now, one of the things that is, as I say, <laughs> what Phil picked up on, of course, was that there are going to be people on some of the out, outer distance routes where maybe they're only carrying seven people in rush hour on a, on a bus. That bus is now going to be entirely discontinued. So those seven people who were in the district now can remember it as being in the district. Well, and, and to Phil's comment, that's... Um, this is a very touchy issue. I mean, I can't imagine anything being more touchy. Well, and, it's, it's going to be ahead. one where um, the drive to put density along those light rail stations because of the convenience, uh, and that's in quotes, uh, of light rail. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the Dr. Cog board uh, and members respond. Uh, because uh, RTD being a regional provider is uh, is is now shrinking from some of that responsibility. When did you you have your hand up? Thanks. Yes, I just wanted to say there is still an option to get from uh, the southern section of Lone Tree Ridgegate Station uh, all the way into Denver without a train change. But that does put you at Union Station. It's it doesn't put you anymore in the central city uh, area. So uh, it's not like we've been 
totally abandoned, but uh, we're more directed in a hub type fashion to Union Station to take a shuttle um, to get to the center of town. Mm -hmm. And those, those trains have been gone since 2020. They removed them for COVID and they've been gone for, you know, going on three years now. So we're kind of used to the situation. Um, we don't like it, but we're used to it. Um, but the cancellation uh, without COVID raises it a different question within the board and of course within those of us who use the transportation um, to to cancel it means that it's gone to say covid we have to cancel temporarily is is different what i meant to introduce is the fact that right now is a time when they are looking at a number a whole number of alternatives all of them to reduce cost and all of them to provide um best service on most popular routes now the disadvantage which which I was speaking to is that that puts a lot of people in, in a, a peculiar situation. Like was just mentioned, sure, from Lone Tree, you can go to, um, go, go to the uh, Union Station, but still the busiest routes, the majority of people still come to downtown. At least their records show that the busiest trains are those that come to downtown. So anyhow, that that's happening. A second thing is that within the um, accessoride, they have made a, a progress on, on a significant change. They've been experimenting for about uh, 18 months on using Uber per, in particular for, as the experimenter to provide a service where instead of um, you having to call into the central office and you have to do it the day before you want to take an accessor ride trip, you now can call Uber if, as long as you sign, you're an accessoride member, and you sign up, and therefore you're you're able to deal with Uber, which means that you have gone through a whole process of uh, getting a, a, a approval and all of that. You can now just make a phone call. I can make a phone call now, and. Uh, probably catch an Uber at uh, about quarter after one uh, and and be able to go. That's a dramatic change from uh, previous situations. And in that light, what the way they uh, assist encouraging people to do it is not only the fact that you can do it the same day, but also they subsidize the trips. And now it's a a $25 subsidy, the first $25 is paid by RTD. And lest you think that, gee, what a waste of RTD money, that's a substantial reduction of the cost of operating the vans. So uh, that, that's something they're into and have expanded. They are right now in the process of adding Lyft, uh, yellow cab and and a couple of others so that within the next i would think three months though they're saying 30 days my i would suggest within three months those of us who use accessoride will have a whole new opportunity for convenience and that will result 
if we if we use it uh, in a reduction of pressure on accessoride to in, keep increasing the amount of service they have to provide by the vans. So I thought you might be interested in that as uh, several mm -hmm. things happening. Thank you, Tex. Jayla's got her hand up. Yes, Jayla. Oh, my God. Hey, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity. We have someone that has a very important birthday coming up. Um, and we, uh, uh, it's Tex. Tex's birthday is coming up here. Um, and I don't, I think our meeting, you will have it before our next meeting, right? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> share how old you'll be, Tex, or do you want to share? 91. 91. How awesome is that? So let's uh, wish him happy birthday. Happy birthday. Can yeah. we sing to him? Happy <laughs> birthday. Happy birthday, Tex. Yes. Thank you all. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing, um, Tex. And just a quick side note, there's one of our clients that lives in the Audrey in Highlands Ranch who utilizes the exactly what you're talking about with the Accessoride and the Uber partnership. And he is thrilled. It, it's been a real positive for him in able to get around. So it, it could be a really good thing, but as Tex says, you know, there's lots of wrinkles as well. So I am going to adjourn us uh, four minutes early unless anybody else has something they want to say. When is our next meeting, Jayla or Mindy? Oh, now you're going to ask hard questions. <laughs> let's see. At the end of the agenda, let's see, the 24th of February. 24th of February. So, um, I will see you all in a month. Stay safe and warm. Well, we know you're going to stay warm in, over the next week, Carrie. Yeah. We leave tomorrow for Hawaii, and I'll nice. share real quickly. It's my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, and we are taking them nice. to Hawaii, and uh, the, there's 14 of us going. So we're pretty excited. So excited. Yay. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care.